Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Really excited about this episode. We're going way back. We're going retro. We're diving into some traditions that we want to bring back. Yeah, we're going to talk about the things that Catholics have done for centuries that we no longer do that we really need to start doing again. So let the trad times roll. Let's go. Welcome back. I'm super excited about this episode. We got Father Justin Fletcher in the uh, studio with us, as, as well as Father Rich and Ryan. Father Justin Fletcher is a priest of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. Did I say that right? That's correct. Thank you. Thank first you. Time. Thank first you. time. Good to have you here Thank today. You. He rehearsed that. He rehearsed that, Father. Yeah. Yeah. It took him at least two hours to get that one out. About an hour and a half. Just Come on. Half. Out of You're, you. Been great. <laughs> So yeah, today we're going to talk about some of the things, some some really great traditions that, you know, we're not talking about becoming, uh, you know, a fanatical tratty here. What we're talking about are things that really enrich the Catholic faith that that over the course of the last couple of decades have really fallen away from the church that um, we want to explore and have you to consider that you should start, you know, upholding these things in your life and in your faith also. Because I think ultimately they contribute greatly contribute greatly to the practice of the faith, as well as tie in in the lineage of that practice and that praxis of faith, that sense of collegiality between generations, something that's more transcendent that we could get a taste of in relationship to tradition and exploring those traditions once again. And speaking of exploring, we're glad that you explore us on the enters of webs and you go to catholictalkshow.com and you figure out how you want to view or listen in. Obviously, we're on YouTube and we're also in various different methods of distribution in audio. So check us out on Stitcher and Google Play. Play G Google go Play. Pray. There you go. That should be something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm then, sure they're going to get right on there. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously Spotify as well. So make sure you're checking out our website, subscribing. We'll be sending you emails and updates with the great show that we have, as well as Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. This is our way to interact with you on those social dynamics on the enters of webs and making sure that we're continuing to connect with all of our listeners and our viewers. And most especially, my brothers and sisters, please consider supporting our show by going to patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. In there, you can be able to support us in all these different tiers and get some really cool items like coffee mugs that you see in Ryan Shields' hands, mm -hmm. as well as this band, Pray for Vocations, hoodies, and all other sorts of good things. So make sure that you're connecting with us on the Patreon app, and your support helps us to grow the show and to ensure that this content continu continues to get to you in all those various ways. Awesome. Well, good job. Thank yeah, you. that was that was good. Have you done that before? I've had a couple of times. <laughs> practice. We're talking about practice. <laughs> You know, I, I think it was Chester who said that tradition is the democracy of the dead. And it's a way that the people uh, who have passed the faith down from the apostles to our ancestors, to us, continue to have a say in the practice of the Catholic faith. And those voices and those traditions really should not be overlooked. Now, after the Second Vatican Council and the kind of post-conciliar upheaval, a lot of really great traditions were lost in the shuffle. Now, I don't think that was necessarily the intention. Sometimes it was, other times it wasn't. But with this kind of new breath that they were trying to bring into the church, a lot of these things that were more of a maybe a personal devotion or devotions that were more popularized among the people kind of got de-emphasized. And we've lost some things that really made the Catholic faith, number one, unique among all the faiths. And it, there's been a bit of a homogenization of the way that we practice our faith, whether it's through a more Protestantized liturgy or just a lack, a more secular view of how we view holy days. Um, and the other thing is that it really, I think, um, is, is a robbery of the deposit of our traditions that things that really help to uh, make our faith more alive and more integral and more something that we brought into the home and into everyday life and things that help connect us both liturgically, spiritually, and with the flow of the calendar to our faith. And these are things that we want to talk about today because these are things that I think the church really needs to bring back. Mm -hmm. We'll and call it we'll call it enrichment. Uh, enrichment. Trademark. Uh. Ding. 
So let me say this, though, too. In the process of deliberation that was that was taking place in Vatican II, not speaking as an authority like I was there, because obviously none of us were around mm. at that period of time, but knowing that the concept behind it was there were so many things that attached to the liturgy. There were so many things that were going on in practice and tradition and custom that they actually looked at very deeply and said, okay, what is the essence of what we do as a people, right? Ritually speaking, as the Latin church what is our tradition? What is our ritual, strictly speaking? So, you know, in times when we're cleaning house in the springtime, we, you know, we, we take everything out and we evaluate and we wash everything from head to toe. And now is the period of time in the church history for us to look at some of these traditions that really would fit most beautifully in the essence of what we do as a Catholic people. Yeah. And that's why we're so, so kind of honored to be able to have you as a guest today. Uh, thank you. Because um, if, if you would explain for our listeners really what the personal ordinariate is and some of the kind of hallmarks, because I know that the personal ordinariate, I've been to liturgies, it is, I think, a perfect balance between that tradition and some of the innovations of the Second Vatican Council. It's a, To me, it's the perfect balance. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the the ordinary is um, well, it was really conceived by two different two kind of two different things all at once. On the one hand, uh, it, its immediate precursor is what they call the pastoral provision, uh, which was uh, former Episcopal churches coming into the Catholic Church and being part of an archdiocese or, or a diocese. So the very first ones in San Antonio, Our Lady of the Atonement, and uh, they came over in 1982 is when they began. And there was about, uh, you know, everyone, you get different numbers, but everyone comes up with 12 for some strange reason. I don't know why 12, but that's what everyone seems. They all started with 12 people. And um, and so uh, so they started, and they were able to keep some of their traditions that they had brought with them from Anglicanism. So if you read the documents of the Second Vatican Council, it says very clearly that there are elements of sanctification uh, that are that impel towards Catholic unity. There are things that are outside the visible bonds of the church that make people want to be Catholics. Right. And so so they identified what some of those were, and um, and so they came over. But it's kind of strange because, you know, they started off like this, and they're doing slightly different things, and then you get a new bishop. And the new bishop hadn't heard of you, and they're trying to get a <laughs> sense of the diocese, and the, what the heck are y'all doing? Uh, you say, what? You know, and, and so that, that was uh, a, an interesting kind of experiment. And so um, in the early part of this century, uh, Pope Benedict, uh, under his guidance, uh, reconceived of it to create what the archdiocese, the military archdiocese, which a lot of people have heard of, does, which is because it's too confusing for guys who are in the military who are priests to incarnate in every diocese they go in because they're American military priests uh, all over the world, right? So they're in China, they're in Hawaii, they're in uh, Germany, they're in South Carolina, they're in Texas, and everywhere in between. And so they conceived of a, of a roving diocese for all of those guys to be a part of because they all understood each other, and so the, it's the military ordinariate. And so what Pope Benedict conceived of was to make uh, the personal ordinariates uh, for converting Anglicans, to, to group all of them together in one uh, roving diocese that would be gathered not by territory, like most of our dioceses are, but rather by a sort of distinctive personality. Uh, and so actually, uh, the bishop is here in Houston, Texas, for the, for the ordinariate for North America, so it's all of North America, uh, we've got a little community uh, as far south as Athens, Georgia, and as far north as Halifax, and then all the way over in British Columbia and all the way down to San Diego and places in between. Oh, so, wow. now, now in England, it's called the uh, Our Lady of Walsh. That's right. That's right. The personal mm -hmm. ordinary of Our Lady of Walsh. Now, right. in the United States, it is the personal ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter. Yeah, that's And that Chair of St. Peter being kind of that sign of Christian unity. That's exactly that, right. Yeah, that's right. exactly right. And what a great concept of governance, too, so that the Holy Father has almost immediacy <laughs> To your ordinariate, that's right. Through your bishop, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's great. So, well, and that's the thing for so many people <clears throat> who convert is, you know, the, the question of the pope. Because if you grew up, you know, Protestant, you know, you think like the pope sends you a letter every day about which kind of underwear you can wear and stuff like that. And, and <laughs> I, think, so, I got my letter today. Yeah. I got my letter as well. I, right? I don't have any on. Briefs. I didn't get one. That's why I didn't get it was brief. He told, <laughs> me, he told me commando today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also in the same way. That's why I don't have any on. Yeah. Didn't tell me. Didn't exactly. tell me I don't know what to do with the pump. Trademark, but put an I at the end, TMI. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, for a lot of people who are Protestants, they have no idea what the role of the Pope actually is, right? Um, and, and what the role of the Pope is in the daily life of a Catholic. And so to convert really requires a true love of the papacy, a true love of the Holy Father, 
both personally, because he, he's your spiritual father on earth, but also the, the institution, right? The institution of the papacy. So, so it's a very fitting thing for, the, for those of us who are converts to, to have that. Now, and you sound very English. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my second well, language. Well, well, so, so my that, second language. Right, there you go. Yeah, I mean, do I pick up a London accent? <laughs> well, I, well, so no, I think we mostly all London, speak, Texas. Yeah, no, we mostly speak. Um, we all we mostly all speak. Uh, I think Midland English. I think is what we speak <laughs> actually. Right. So now, one of the things that, uh, at least from my experience, is the hallmarks of uh, ordinary at parishes is that they really are tied to tradition, and a lot of the traditions sure. that we lost at the Second Vatican Council, the Ang- the former Anglican or Episcopal. Uh, yep. parishes didn't have that loss. So when they were brought into the fold, they were able to almost bring those traditions back to the church with them. And I think a lot of those stem from the um, the Oxford movement, correct? Well, really, really, they they really, partially that's true, but they also really stem from the time when, when the Church of England was Catholic before, right? Mm-hmm. They just didn't lose everything. Uh, uh, the, the, the Reformation in England was a very strange thing because um, it, it, it didn't get away from everything that it had received, like... Uh, like so many other uh, places where the Reformation happened, so things, things like Ember Days and Rogation Days, um, and and certain other, uh, both cultural things and and, and architectural things, uh, just never left. Right, right? now, uh, uh, we now that we're Catholics again, uh, we we kept the statues with their heads on them because that was a thing for a while to have headless statues in Anglicanism. Because you guys are creating headless saints on the Catholic know. side, well, I don't really know. <laughs> by, 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 by order of the king, it seems so hard to me to cut off their heads. But they did the stone heads; they cut off. Wow! So if you go to England and the cathedrals that got stolen, you know there's headless saints. Wow! That's interesting. interesting. But no one knows where the heads are. So you actually you mentioned a couple of the traditions that <clears throat> I think would really be beneficial for the church to bring back, and you mentioned Ember Days and Rogation Days. Now let's talk about Ember Days first. Mm-hmm. Now, why don't you explain a little bit what Ember Days are? Yeah, so Ember Days are, are things that happen four times a year. Uh, they typically happen uh, uh, around the change of the seasons. So uh, around the beginning of Advent, actually St. Lucy's Day, which is December 13th, uh, and then uh, the first after the first Sunday of Lent. And then uh, we have one coming up um, around uh, Pentecost, after, after uh, Pentecost Sunday, and then uh, in uh, September around Holy Cross Day. And they are the Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday after those days. So the old saying would be what? Lenti, Penti, Cruci, and Lucy? There it is. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. How did you find that? That's pretty I just, good. I, I drink and I know things. Okay. All right. <laughs> and, and so those times uh, are both times in which generally uh, people were ordained. A mm-hmm. lot of times people were ordained on those days. And it also was always a time uh, when people made special uh, petition uh, for, for people who were to be ordained and a prayer for more vocations. And so it, because it was a time, you know, the way... In real life, like you got to have a house that you live in, right? And you got to have a bed you sleep in. You ever met the people who try to sleep in a different bed every night? It doesn't actually work, right? You know, you got to like have the place you sleep every night. And so, you should be praying for vocations all the time, of course. But the church, in her wisdom, thought, well, if we have these particular times when this is when we remember, oh, right, we'll, we'll do it then. And they're tied to really important days, right? They're tied to uh, Pentecost, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're tied to Holy Cross Day because all priests are configured to the cross of Christ. They're tied to Lent because uh, the life of a priest should be a life of penance. They're tied to St. Lucy, who's one of the great uh, saints of the church, one of the great Roman saints of the church. Uh, and so those are the days where we where we especially implore God for more uh, more priests and better priests, basically. Yeah, and, and one of the things I think that's really unique about Ember Days is that they're tied to the seasons. Yep. And it also gives a Catholic a, a, a view of the calendar, a view of the passing of the year, of where they can mark those passings of the seasons and the design of God in the way that seasons change. Um, so you have summer, spring, fall, winter. You understand the passing of time, and that the, they set aside a couple days. <laughs> it's uh, three days. Yep. Each uh, Ember days are three days in each one of those periods. Now the Latin word for it was quaterani tempora, right? And those three days would so four, you know, four times a year uh, uh, along mm-hmm. with the time of the year. So fast the four seasons. So during those three days, you'll fast. You'll make uh, penitential prayers, and so it's like almost mini Lent's throughout the year. So and I think that's something that I, I know people love Lent, but if you have those, you know, little periods, it's three days, four times a year, to where you can have a mini Lent and a little death to yourself and you could pray for more vocations, you could pray for the Holy Father, you can pray for unity. 
setting aside that time is really important. Mm-hmm. And, and that's clearly a great example of a tradition that can come back that doesn't threaten anything, but only enhances the practice of our faith. Right. And to break that down into a quadrant of, a, you know, to realize that I'm anticipating this shift in season, I'm anticipating the shift and the changing of time. Right. And in that changing of time, why not offer sacrifice and pray for what is the greatest need, which is that priestly sacrifice and to pray for vocations. I think of my my ordination, I was ordained on the on the birthday of John Paul II that happened to be that year leading up to my first liturgy as an ordained priest, the Feast of Pentecost. So it was that shift of season, the shift of time that I recall just so fondly. And I think we need to bring that back so that it's participating in those shifts of time and change. And then there are men being ordained. There are women making profession and vow. And to realize that in that offering, the church is being renewed in a constant sense of that renewal that we are called to, ecclesia semper reformandum, that the church is in a constant state of being reformed, renewed, and commissioned constantly by Christ. You know, and one of the things that I I really conceptually like about Ember Days is that, look, this is going to work just as well in a smells and bells traditional Latin parish as it is in a, a, a felt banners and tambourine parish, right? This is not something that has to be tied to a particular liturgical custom. It is the setting aside of days for... Uh, for sacrifice and penitential prayer and fasting. Yeah, in the Bible, even even Jesus says, you know, pray for harvesters. You know, I mean, he, there's a few times where Jesus encourages us to pray, mm-hmm. and and that was one of them. And there's even liturgies that you can celebrate for the harvest, the new right. harvest, yeah. and and also for vocations and and for all of that. So that's that's a good point. Now, here's an interesting fact around Ember Day. So again, in Latin, uh, the Ember Days, the Ember Tides were known as Quatro Ani Tempora, right? So the Portuguese uh, missionaries to Japan and to the Southeast Asia, they were keeping <clears throat> ember tides, right? <clears throat> now, when you think of really excellent Japanese food, what do you call like a you know, great fried shrimp in Japan? Mm-hmm. Tempura. Yes. Right? Tempura. Tem- yeah. Tempura. Yeah. Saki. Man, now I'm really hungry, dude. So Don't tempura, do this to me right now. I'm starving. Tempura came because the, the Portuguese and Spanish missionaries couldn't eat meat during ember tides. So they got into the practice of taking shrimp and fish and frying it mm. or quattro ani tempori. Mm. And then it just became, mm. hey, these Portuguese, they're eating their tempura Ooh. food. So that's where you get the Japanese tempura. tempura. Pretty interesting, yeah. Oh, St- stop being hungry and listen I'm to that. I'm starving, man. I'm thinking thing, of sake man. and wasabi and like Think with your head, not your tummy. Well, well, yeah, it's hard, tempura. man. You're there's, really there's pulling some me Catholicness in. to it. So, uh, like, let's bring tempura to the table, just like we're going to bring the amber days. Look, back I mean, to I the think church. that's a great tradition. Look, dude, go out and get tempura during these couple times Why a year. Not? Yeah, I mean, it's like that's Japanese that's, it's, Portuguese it's, mashup. It's it almost like that, that tradition Japanese. of you know, like Fridays, meatless Fridays, and like the sense of at the seminary, we used to go out and eat sushi and tempura every Friday during Lent, and it really gave a sense of. One, this is this is really wonderful to get together with the brothers and and have a meal, a common meal in a certain discipline. Yeah. You know, th- we're we're being disciplined here, even though we ate a little too much sushi because it was an all you can eat kind of a place. But oh, the, that place is good. Is that place great? Right? Yeah, down by the seminary. So it, it's <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that's a really great and valid point. So another one, another tradition that I think we can bring back, and I know this one. This one's very specific to the church in, in England, and that's Rogation Days. Yep. Will you explain that a little bit for everyone? Yeah, so Rogation Days are actually, they're very similar to uh, to the Ember Days in the sense that they're also three days, uh, and they happen the three days uh, between um, uh, Rogation Sunday, which is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and and, Pen- uh, and Ascension, so the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday between those three. and uh, Those are the minor Rogations. The, yeah, that's right. The, the minor Rogations is the... The, the, what does rogation mean? It comes from the Latin verb rogare, which means to ask. Yes. So you're basically asking God to hold back his anger, to hold back uh, the, the wrath of nature, to protect you from natural calamities, to protect you from famines and failed harvests. Yeah, fire, famine, and flood, and disease are the idea you want to try and get rid of. Yeah, State Farm uh, should have. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's part of the problem, right, is this is, uh, all these things came up before the idea of insurance. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, we think if we have enough money, we don't have to pray to God anymore. But, that's a uh, great point. Yeah, that's, that's it's, the, uh, it's the privilege mm-hmm. of 
uh, rich Westerners to not be able to have to believe in God because we're so pl- uh, privileged that we don't have to. Mm. We have insurance. Yeah. Yeah, so back in the days for insurance, um, the rogation days were times, and it, 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 it makes more sense in places like England where it's chilly, right? Uh, it's chillier than, than in the southern part of the U.S. where it's been warm for a long time. So it'd be a time right when we were starting to, to plant things, right? And so it's a, it's a prayer exactly to, uh, to supplicate God um, to prevent uh, famine, fire, flood, and disease uh, so that there would be a harvest at the end. That that was the practical thing, but there's actually a much deeper thing uh, and and the kind of the more fun thing, which you can get on the interwebs and find uh, all kinds of videos of it still, uh, where people do what's called beating the bounds. And so, you know... Every, is it the procession? Yeah, that's right. So every church is, uh, is, is bound up uh, with a parish boundary, right? And so you've got... Yeah, everyone. This every, is this is now. This is a particular part. Pay attention because this is the this part is cool. that I think that with rogation days, this would be cool if we brought this back. It would be, people would love this. Yeah, it'd be kind of hard because the parishes are big now. Because you know England's a tiny place, but so the idea is every parish has got a boundary, and so you know it, everywhere you are in the world, you're in some parish boundary, no matter what, whether you're um, you know it doesn't matter. And so the idea was that you would go in procession. Uh, and you'd bring the Blessed Sacrament, and people would be praying rosaries, and there'd be incense and all the rest, and you would trace the borders of your boundaries of your parish. And you would do that while uh, the people who weren't holding other stuff, they would have like willow reeds or or sticks and things like this, and they'd be beating the bounds of the parish because um, the the demons and all the rest are hiding in the bounds trying trying to find a way in. And so you want to keep all of them out because that's uh, that's your responsibility. The idea is that every parish has the responsibility of cleansing the place that God has planted them and that they they are responsible for praying to God for that protection for that place. And and the, and the, the most beautiful thing is when you see one parish going one way and the other parish going the other way, you know, and, 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 it's, and isn't beating it, it's each of, other. Yeah, that's kind of like... Uh, <laughs> Anchor, that's, just, that's like Anchorman when they have the uh, the, the street fights. <laughs> Father, did you just stab someone with a trident? <laughs> Couldn't tell. Priest or demon. <laughs> so, so that and that still happens in places in England too. Actually, mm. uh, you can still find they, they don't know what they're doing anymore because you know it's England and it's all that. But yeah. uh, but but it's a great practice actually because it it has both a practical thing right, which is that. You do want, need to pray uh, because any good thing we have comes from God. And so any protection we have and good weather we have is God's gift to us. And so you got to get your food and all the rest from somewhere. And that, of course, ultimately comes from God. But also the, the spiritual importance of that, of taking responsibility for this patch of land, that, right. that this is what God has given us to take care of. Now, yeah. in relation to Rogation Day and Ember Days, is this, strictly speaking, an Anglican no, tradition? No, absolutely or does not. This, so that's why I'm kind I mean, of Ember pitching Days, this. They brought to Japan, they yeah, brought everywhere. But, but what I'm asking you is, what is the actual history, and how far does this date back? Because oh, you are the what, historian. Well, Rogation Days go back to a bishop of northern France, St. Uh, Mamertus. Mm-hmm. And this was the 470s to 500, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. Uh, the bishop, I think of Vienne, something mm-hmm. somewhere like that. So to be able to so realize this, this, is, this goes way back, right? Yeah, that the, the tradi- mm-hmm. that these traditions Thousand don't just come old. from England; they they come from the rich the tradition church. of the universal church. But like he said, that with the Reformation, the way that it happened, that the Anglican Church retained a lot of this, mm-hmm. whereas a lot of the other Protestant traditions did not. But then the Catholic, the Western Church, lost these traditions after Vatican II. So it's almost like if looking at how the monasteries preserved the work of the Greek philosophers, even though they were not Greek, they were kind of transplanted and protected and inside the walls of these mm-hmm. monasteries. Well, inside of the walls of Anglicanism, some of these traditions that the church lost and the West lost were protected there. And this Along is preci- with lots of heresies. <laughs> well, a lot of heresies too. That's true. But this is this is precisely where we see the inclusivity of what Pope Benedict was able to secure in relationship to this ordinariate, and then the contribution of what you are bringing in culture and tradition that is being retained from the Universal Church's yeah. history books. That is, in and of itself, a great gift because God is again grafting together our vine so that we are most fruitful. And this is a new harvest and a new beginning, which is something that we should be ultimately excited about and celebrating in respect to all of the parish boundaries around the world and to truly realize that this ordinariate is a great gift to the universality of the church. Yeah, I think with Laudato Si, I think it was a missed opportunity to really bring back rogation days 
with maybe even an increased understanding that we now have a more conscientious approach to how we are stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. And with Laudato Si talking about ecology and protection of the environment, uh, before where irrigation days were really about the protection of the harvest and the plant and all of that, and also to protect your parish boundaries, Rogation days, I think, can be adapted to the modern understanding of being good stewards of the earth mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So including some of that in there. And uh, perhaps out of Laudato Sea, that can maybe start to uh, go out to where parishes start saying, look, we need to protect this land. We need to bless this land. We need to pray for this land that we are personally responsible for using that kind of that solidarity and subsidiarity. Let's go local first, buy local, pray local type mm -hmm. approach. Mm hmm and, you know, in the springtime of the church that we are currently in, to realize that responsibility that Father Justin explained so clearly that we have a responsibility, spring cleaning, we've got a responsibility to cleanse, to pray, and to center ourselves back on this new beginning that Christ is offering to us by mercy, his mercy. So to realize that this could be, you know, really applied very, very soon, and you're fitting the tradition. As a new pastor, I'm looking at a blank canvas because mm. it is a brand new church, literally. I don't know, dude, walking around in that t in that Florida heat, <laughs> wearing your vestments. It's called sacrificium. Oh, that's right. It. All right, so speaking of sacrifice, that, that's a good segue into the next topic. And I think that one of the things that Catholics have really lost that was so kind of uniquely Catholic and everyone recognized about Catholic Church was Meatless Fridays. And after the Second Vatican Council, um, they changed the rules and they made it uh, to where you no longer had to abstain from meat on Fridays. So people stopped eating meat on Fridays, but they didn't really quite do that. They just said that your type of penance on Fridays became up to your personal preference. You had to make some sort of sacrifice. Well, everyone stopped eating. So everyone started eating meat on Fridays, but they didn't replace it with something else. And I think that kind of... Uh, conflicted rules and that amb ambiguous, ambiguous nature of those rules um, is kind of a mistake. And I think we should just go right back to carte blanche. Mm. No more meat on Fridays. Because it's, it's not almost, that hard. It's almost as if like permission is, okay, We you don't have to observe this anymore. Now I don't have to observe anything. anything. Exactly. And it opened the door wide to that type of a practice. Slippery slope. Slippery it's just slope. like with the kids, man. Yeah, you can't give it. You give them an inch, They're Brian. to take a mile. That's true. You know, a couple of years ago, I saw this movement on social media, and it's still out there. And it's about, you know, ecological concerns, because one of the biggest contributing factors, according to those crazy climate change scientists who are all full of hooey, <laughs> is that the consumption of meat is one of the leading causes of methane and climate change chemicals in the air and whatnot. So they try to push this movement called Meatless Mondays. They're like, everyone should just <laughs> not eat meat on Mondays. And if the whole world did this, it'd be better. And I'm like... You idiots. There's nothing new under the sun. We had Meatless Fridays for 1,500 years. Why not just call it Meatless Fridays again, right? So I, I you know. We bringing it back. We bringing it back and it goes a little something like this. Is that, no? Yeah. Don't you cut that? that? No, we don't have to. <laughs> so, no, but I mean, how many people do you know who eat meat on Fridays but have not replaced it with other some sort of penitential sacrifice? No, everyone is nicer on Fridays, actually. That's what they do. Their sacrifices would be a little nicer. I'm going to be a little nicer. Are they really? <laughs> oh, absolutely. You can see it. Is that intentional? Because there's yeah. no work. Yeah. You know, the next day. It. The weekend's coming. <laughs> Everybody's a little nicer on Fridays. Yeah, but I, I don't How think... How would it... you quantify niceness? <laughs> I can't. I can't. How I'm can you quantify man. meatless Friday? Don't put meat in your pie hole. Boom. I think it's pretty clear. Boom. <laughs> right. So wow. It, it, we just it, solving the world's problems right here. <laughs> number one, it's a great penitential practice. Number two, it's tied to tradition and history. Number three, it's a very uniquely and deeply Catholic thing. Number four, it's ostensibly better for the ecology. Number five, it's healthy. It's healthy. It's absolutely healthy. There is literally no reason that Catholics should no longer, uh, uh, you know, should. And keep on eating meat on Friday. Just everyone should just do it. And, they, do and, it. and I think that the catechism should just straight up say, "Look, do we're it. changing this back. Yeah, we should bring it back. Let's bring it I back." Thought, I thought it was the USCCB like made it an obligation no. recently. No. no. Okay. No, they're not quite so bold. Yeah. Well, we're bold right here. Well, I think this do is it. this is a good consideration. 
as well as just, you know, the, the, our family, our, our family base here in the Catholic talk show to continue to talk about it and, and continue to apply these things. And those movements, you know, it's a grassroots movement in the church. Again, it, the church recognizes that. So, you know, the stewardship, not that we should criticize the USCCB or the, the bishops don't do this or the bishops don't do that. They need to recognize and meet through their listening sessions the practice of the people and to be able to guide and shepherd and recognize that this is what the church really wants to bring back. Yeah, and again, it's one of those traditions that the church could bring back that is just as applicable in the Smells and Bells Parish as it is in the Felt and Tambourine Parish. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look, in the Felt and Tambourine Parish, look, it's healthier. It puts less taxes on the uh, you know eco ecology. Uh, it's more humane towards animals, whatever your happy reasons are. And then in the traditional parishes, you're making a sacrificial. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, it's something that really can go across all boundaries. It's a tradition that is universal. It's Catholic. And it doesn't get into the camp of tradi versus modernist, left versus right. It's just a, look, if you're Catholic, I don't care what flavor Catholic. This is something that applies to everyone. Mm -hmm. Because we don't we don't need camps Right. In relationship to all of this, we need to recognize universality and celebrate it. And tradition is not a tratty thing. Exactly. It's tradition. Right. And we need to honor it and we need to recognize it. And where it can be applied, apply it. I think that's great. And the thing, you know, for all of us is, in my opinion, is that we all need direct commands help. They help me mm -hmm. do Clarity. this, do this, don't do this. And, you know, when someone says, well, try to do something, well, you know, that's when I was, before I was ordained, I'd go to confession and the priest would say, well, for your penance, be joyful. I'm, well, what the blank is that supposed to mean? Right. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I need, to, I need the priest to tell me, go say this prayer. Mm -hmm. That's my, then I know I've com yeah. completed my penance. And so I think for most of us, uh, at least for the simple-minded amongst us, that would be me. Soul table. I, I, need, uh, I need somebody to say, don't eat meat on Fridays. And, and actually, if you want even beyond the Christian pale, the, actually one of the most interesting accounts of this, it actually comes from the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. You ever read it? So he goes to prison, right? And he, he converts to Islam in prison. And in his defining mark of what he knows that means to come to be a believer is he doesn't eat pork anymore. And like that simple reality for him, when the pork comes across the plate, he just says, no, I'm a, I'm a Muslim now. And so there's this sense of what you eat and what you don't eat uh, very practically changes who you are. Yeah, show me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's a, it, and so that that's, gets to the really deep roots of why it's not just a, you know, a nice practice and because tomorrow you get to eat a hamburger anyway, uh, but actually it's. Uh, forming your body and your life uh, to the life of the church uh, is is an enormous gift. So uh, so there's there's room for that to actually reach across the table to talk not only to, amongst the rad trads and the uh, what did you call them the the felt felt and tambourines and everywhere in between yeah uh, but also uh, people who who uh, are of different religions altogether who who recognize the importance of those things mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's good. And it's important to realize, too, you know, like a lot of our, our families in the Middle East, you know, and, and the practices of the faith all throughout India, for example, they observe vegetarian. Some of them do. No, I mean, I mean, like it, through Lent, bro, they do oh, not well, yeah, eat. Gotcha, they yes. do not eat meat, period. Or dairy. For, or dairy. Yeah. I mean, they, they have a very strict observance. And this is deeply rooted within the, the ancient practices of of our respective rituals and as well as religious observance. So it's not just like, oh, I'm not going to eat meat. I'll eat lobster. Tomorrow I'll have, like you said, Father Justin. I mean, it's it's a really good point that this immediately associates with a religious observance. And we are called to greater observance, more vigilant observance. And this is placed before you from the church, Holy Mother Church, that's dictating these things. There is still an observance upon us on Fridays. But most of us are not observing mm -hmm. anything except a nice steak dinner at mm -hmm. the local steakhouse. Because it's Friday. Because it's Friday. And don't got to work tomorrow. You don't no. have to work yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Another yeah, exciting one I mentioned, we're talking about other traditions. So um, one that has come through the ordinary as well. Um, so what we, most Catholics call Fat Tuesday in the ordinary, we call Shrove Tuesday. Shrove Tuesday. Shrove, yeah. And it's where you... Uh, before it was uh, before it was Protestant, that meant that the day you wouldn't get shriven, you got your sins shriven. So you would go and make your confession on on the day before Ash Wednesday, but uh, that also meant that you go eat a big old stack of pancakes about like this, 
because the tradition, just like in India, as you're saying, Father, was that um, in England, that basically everyone made a, um, a vegan fast all throughout Lent. So, so you get rid of all your eggs and all your milk and all what, what makes the egg, you know, with flour, eggs, and milk, what do you make? Right. Pancakes. Pancakes. And, yeah. so, and so I don't know most, I don't think most people in the ordinary are uh, going vegan for Lent, but we still all eat big old fat stacks of pancakes <laughs> and we do confess our sins. But Yeah, we talked about that yeah, just from two days on, on one of our previous shows. Another tradition that I think, uh, again, it's one of those things that it, it doesn't put people into camps, but it's an excellent tradition. That's the first Friday devotion. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you guys do this? In yeah, the, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we do both the first Friday and first Saturday. Okay. Yeah. So first mm-hmm. Friday, we, uh, as always, we do the Sacred Heart devotion. Yep. So we, we, we have a Mass for the Sacred Heart, uh, and then we have uh, benediction uh, and adoration, and then we do the same on, on Saturdays with, with the litany and things like that. So the first Friday devotions... That is where people take the, make the devotion of going for nine consecutive months to Mass on the first Friday of the month, um, if, you know, in devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The first nine months? If the first, so for nine months, like a novena. Any mm-hmm. nine months in a row. Any nine oh, months okay. in a row. Yeah, on the first Friday of the month, you go and receive communion, you go to Mass, and then you, uh, you in devotion to the Sacred Heart. It's not a bad thing to get people to go to Mass on a Friday once a month and get them out of the routine of only going on Sundays. Um, it's a really popular devotion because it's Fridays. I mean, how many people are at your Masses on Fridays? Well, it's still yeah. a tradition. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's still a tradition. It was a tradition in my last parish. Yeah. I went into a parish recently named the pastor of a, of a beautiful parish in Nocatee. And when I went there, one of the first requests from the parishioners do you think we could have like a first Friday and first Saturday devotion? See, people are hungry and, for and it. And they sheep, yeah. he, he kind of sheepishly approached <laughs> it because he wanted to be careful that he wasn't going to overstep his boundaries and make me feel like, well, I need to execute my authority over this and blah, 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 blah. And I don't think, I'm like, just so you know, I love first Friday and first Saturday devotion to the sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary. I said, give me some time so I can come in and adapt to the environment, meet the people, but I assure you, we will bring that back very, yeah. very soon. Now, there are some promises associated with the first Friday and first Saturday devotion. Do you know the promises of the first Friday devotion? Yeah, but I wasn't prepared to talk about that. <laughs> 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 what's, uh, what's first Friday? You get your request. What's the... So, the, so the, the, I forgot. the promises made to... Ryan so, Shield loves to do that, by the way. He's like, yeah. hey, do you, do you know this? You I'm don't know this? I'm, 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 I'm like four for five, though. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You're doing great. Yeah. Yeah. If doing I was great. a baseball You're... player, I would be in the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Yeah, you, yeah, you just stole Wally Pipp's spot over here. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the promises made to St. Margaret Mary by Jesus in devotion to the Sacred Heart is that a person will not die, you know, final he will protect them, right. final death in his displeasure, Right. And then the 12 promises associated with the devotion to the Sacred Heart is that Jesus will grant them all the graces necessary in their state of life, establish peace in their homes, comfort them in their afflictions, secure refuge during life, and above all in death, bestow abundant blessings upon all their undertakings. Sinners will find the Sacred Heart of Jesus at the source of infinite ocean of mercy. Uh, Lukewarm souls shall become fervent. Fervent souls shall quickly mount to a higher perfection. He will bless every place with an image of his sacred heart that is honored. He will give the priests the gift of touching the most hardened of hearts. All those who promote the sacred heart devotion will have his, their names written in his heart. And the last one is that he promises you in the excessive mercy of my sacred heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays in nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace, nor mm. without receiving their sacraments. My mm. divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. So it's a promise if you do this that you're not going to die before getting, uh, you know, last rites. Your last rites. Two statements. One. Why would you not? Right. <laughs> yeah. Two. Ryan Shield had to read everyone verbatim from a screen in front of his face. Yes. That's why I just wanted to just point out. Yes. I just wanted to point that out. I was going to say, how was I supposed to have this memorized? <laughs> right. So We're just coming to your aid here. I appreciate you. Look, got your back, man. Got your back. Yeah. So when well, he got it right. He got final about... perseverance. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Final penance is the main one. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's, that's the, that really that's is the main one. one. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the path. So we got it right. 
And then if anyone can remember all of those verbatim, so a special I place in heaven, question. special place. And that's the 13th so, promise. Yeah. The th I, I have a question <laughs> as, as a married man, can my wife and I rotate uh, months and nope. stuff like that? <laughs> I don't think so. Kind of have it as one. What does your, your computer say? <laughs> says the Indians came from behind and beat the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, you have to actually go okay. and receive communion. All right. All right. So, I mean, but it's one, it's one Friday <laughs> one a month. Friday month. I'm one down. Friday a month. I'm down. The so, first one, though. I had no idea. It has to be the first one, though. First yeah. Friday. And if you if you promote it, then some, somewhere, like kind of like the Stanley Cup, you're going to be etched in Jesus' heart. Yeah, that's, that's a it. beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. Yeah. And if, if I could just share, like the sacred heart of Jesus has been such a tradition in my family in relationship to posting on, on the front door of your house kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And my, my grandparents apartment in Manhattan, the whole apartment was on fire and they were able to evacuate. Everybody evacuated. Everybody was safe. Everything burnt down except the apartment that had the sacred heart image wow. on the other. Awesome. I mean, obviously awesome. there's, you know, but I, I always have such a, a, a memory of devotion to the Sacred Heart through my grandmother family, yeah. and my family, yeah. But talking about tradition, I really hope that what's on the list is kneelers, the, the, the communion rail, because that is one tradition that I think we definitely need to bring back. That is, that's definitely the next one I want to talk about Excellent. Is, is altar rails. Now, this is, number one, from a reverence standpoint, super oh, important. Number yeah. two, just from a pragmatic and practical point of view— Dude, I don't know about you, but when you go to a regular mass, it takes forever to get communion. You're going, they have, there's 100 people and 13 uh, extraordinary, you know. Ministers. Ministers. Extraordinary. 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 There's but they're extraordinary people. They're, but they're there's... extraordinary ministers <laughs> for every single ordinary mass throughout the year. It's yeah. not really an extraordinary situation. Mm -hmm. It takes forever. People lose reverence. And the altar rail, When I look, when I go to a mass where you receive kneeling at the altar mail, uh, the altar rail, it's boom, mm -hmm. and, and boom, it's boom, faster, boom, boom. more reverent, and, and it makes you the give church the communicant. You give the communicant time to prepare, exactly. anticipate prayerfully. You're in one space instead of you're kind of coming up, and you don't want to trip over the person in front yeah. of you. Do I bow? And this person wants to kneel to receive communion. This person wants to stand. It it creates uniformity, and then it creates pace, movement. And everybody's coming before the altar, and there's a clear distinction between sanctuary and what is a sacred space. Yeah, it's almost like a mini iconostasis. Like yeah, I, I think yeah. there's so many benefits to it. Now, obviously, I grew up in a, a, a felt banner and tambourine, parish folk music, and, and there's been beautiful aspects of that in my own life and great memories. However, you know, when I was introduced to the communion rail at Ave Maria University through Father Fessio and through the ministry there at, at the university that I attended for undergrad— my goodness, I felt because at that time I was receiving on my knees. I didn't know where I didn't see that before ever in my life. It's just it arose out of devotion in my heart. And then when I went and I saw all of these young people that are my age are receiving on their knees. This is a really beautiful place. Yeah. I, I, I want to do this you every have, day. Yeah, you have one of the biggest, I think, issues in the church is that a lot of the folks don't even really understand that this is Christ's. That, is, that is the biggest and, problem of the church is the lack of reverence and the lack yeah. of understanding of the true presence. So, yeah. And then, then you got Pope Benedict saying that, um, you know, it, it's this lack of reverence that is one of the biggest problems in the church. So, I mean, you have the lack of belief, you have the lack of reverence, you know, and then I'm in a parish where they put a, a, a rail in. And um, so I've seen the change from without a rail to a rail. And it's it's notice noticeable to say the least, mm -hmm. to say the very very least, it's not noticeable, if not life giving to this parish. And how comforting to be able to go up to that communion rail, not only during the liturgy to receive the Eucharist, but devotionally to go to the communion rail to kneel down in before the sanctuary, and to pray after yeah. mass, to, to do your act of thanksgiving after mass. You don't want to run, go out to the to the parking lot right away. You want to spend time in prayer. Why not go up to the communion rail and just spend on those comfortable little cushions on that beautiful marble little, you're leaning on it. It is wonderful. And I, I have to say, because I know some of our, our pre-Vatican II brethren 
would say, oh, here we go. The, the millennials and the younger people, they want to go back to a church that they don't know. They want to go back to a thing. And it's like, it's not that, guys. It's not about going back to a church that we don't know. It's just simply, we like it. It's beautiful. We want to express ourselves in this. Vatican and this is a did part of great the tradition. Things. Absolutely. Yeah. But there's also some things that were phased out that maybe the, went a little bit that, too far. Yeah. But, but the altar rail has nothing. There's... If you go looking through all the many, many, many thousands of words in the Second Vatican you Council, don't see there's that. not a single one about altar rails. That's there's true. not a single yeah, one about true. it. Uh, well, as as a convert, you know, in the Episcopal Church, everyone, you know, there's a real ugly Episcopal Church right over around here. It's brand new. It's very, very ugly. And the people there are all crazy. I mean, the nice people. I'll see you there. Uh, but even they've got an altar rail. So I didn't know it was a... Um, a point of contention uh, as an Episcopalian. Mm-hmm. Then, I, then I converted, and I realized that for a lot of people, it, it's exactly as you said, Father. Some people feel like people are saying, "Well, let's go." You're trying to go back, but and for me, I, it's just um, uh, if 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 what we say about the mass is true, um, we would really be crawling up there. That's uh, so. And, that's and, right. And, yeah, that's and, a great. And uh, the least it does is get your hands out of your pocket, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and as you're getting ready to receive the Lord of the Universe, you're not picking at your the lint in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, at the very it's least. great too. Like the mass that I went to, at the personal ordinariate of the chair of Saint Peter. It, <laughs> yes, that, right? um, well, that was when up these in guys Indiana. like the priests get into it too. It's like they just kind of cock back, you know, and they're like, "Boy, here he comes!" <laughs> wow, well, they got the patent. They're yeah. like, the okay. Hell? It's awesome. Uh, that is, that's that's their thing is well because we do it with such force uh, that we we also at, at our parish we, we use the patents underneath which I have to admit when I when I came to my parish that I met I thought man that's kind of pretentious having these mm-hmm. little things but mm-hmm. but actually they're extremely practical because we go back to the altar and we're doing the ablutions and almost every time even if we only have ten or fifteen people communicating I don't know if it's because we do it so hard or or what but there's always <laughs> There's always uh, elements of our Lord there on the patent that we've that we've caught, and so instead of somebody kneeling on it and and grinding it into the comfy cushions or whatever else, uh, we saved it. And mm-hmm. and and really, I mean, it shows it, that reverence. It, it, either this is Jesus Christ or it's not. And if it is, we should do everything we can to 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 live as though that were the case. And that comes down to the administration of the parish and to realize that this is an action of reverence to the Blessed Sacrament, yeah. something that is due to the Blessed Sacrament and the person of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And it's something that is an easy attribute yeah. to a sanctuary to add. I got to make a confession. When I'm in a church that doesn't have an altar rail and the usher will come up and down the aisles and say, okay, your row can stand up. And I'll be on this side of the church and there's an aisle on this side and there's two lines. And I look up and I'm like, I got a, I got an extraordinary minister and there's the priest. I'm like, I jump over to the other line. I just do. I have a parishioner. I have a parishioner who came up to me because I've been at my parish now for just for a few weeks and um, <laughs> literally jump line and then you know and I've seen it before. But they came up to me afterwards and said, "Now, Father, do you normally give on the left hand side or the right hand <laughs> side?" And et cetera. So I'll, uh, I pick my family. Pick, we pick the seats because I know where the priest is going to yes. stand. I sit in those seats. So intentionally. Fast forward. I tell them I, I always give on the left. It's just kind of an OCD thing. I, I just that's where I always distribute Holy Communion. Next week rolls around. The deacon went to that place. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I'll just yeah. go to the right. And I look and they're coming down. They look at me. I just look at them and I just smile. I'm like. <laughs> well, if it's a deacon, it's different, you know. It's clergy. Yeah, mean it's clergy. old father. He's got orders. Uh-huh. He's now, got the orders. thing to say, though, of course, is at our parish, we've got an altar rail and, and we use it. But if you can't kneel, don't kneel. Don't kneel. <laughs> That's okay. No, don't you kneel. know, we don't, we don't have, uh, I mean, priests got, we got jobs and stuff. And so we don't have time to like take notes like, oh, Johnny didn't kneel. Maria didn't kneel. And then mm-hmm. we send a little mean note. We don't do that. We stopped doing that. was a, we stopped that when that we came That was a practice the of the, yeah. the previous, previous right. administration. That's exactly right. I mean, so, you know, people kind of get their feelings hurt. Like, they think that someone's judging you. It's no. not, that's not it at all. It's just the opposite. Funny story about how my daughter received her first communion. It was way before she should have. So I started going to a, uh, a parish that celebrated Mass according to the old, right, you know. And they had an altar rail. And she was, you know, you she receives, in our diocese, you receive first Holy Communion in second grade. Well, she was in kindergarten. And she was still a little bit squirmy, and just her and I had went to Mass that day, and we're in the Latin Mass parish. And I go up to the altar, and I'm like, I don't want to leave her in the seat because she's squirming around. So I'm like, come with me. And I go up, and I kneel, and she kind of just kneels next to me. And then Father comes down, boom, boom, boom. (laughs) 
And she's just standing there, and I receive communion, and my eyes closed, and I look over, and she's like this, and boom. She got her first communion by accident at the altar rail. My son did that, too. So after Mass, I go, I go into the sacristy. I'm like, uh, Father, Father Bede, uh, what should I do? My daughter just received Holy Communion. He's like, celebrate. He, well, number one, he's like, <laughs> this is your fault. This is not my fault. This is on you. Uh, that's, and, a, that's a priest talking yeah, about he's that. Like, I, I'm like, what should I do? He's like, this is on you. This is not on me. You shouldn't have brought her up there. And you know what you should do? You know what you should do? Go bake her a, a cake because she just got her first Holy Communion. <laughs> and, then, and then he comes up to her. He's like, come Go here. Bake her a cake. And he goes, come here, little child. Congratulations, and he he blesses her because he's like you're such a beautiful child, and he looks at me, he's like, you know, <laughs> he's like this is on you, terrible parent. Oh, that's so. So funny. that was that was my daughter's oh, first gosh. communion. Wow. My son turned around and was like, you know, like I I received communion because I I would take him away from it all the time. You know, like you can't have communion until you're done. And we were on this uh, family mission, and we were in the back because some of our kids were sick, so we had separated the kids from quarantine, the right. And so I had no way to restrain him or anything. I just hoped that he would, you know, and I wasn't watching him. I hadn't seen him do it before. He went right up there. And I'm just like, mm. is that Vinny Boobots? No, that's Joe. Oh, that was Joe. Joe and he turned wow. around. He's like, got you, Dave. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. And I did the same thing. And the priest said, man, we got to celebrate. Yeah. I was like, okay. So, you know, those are just some of the traditions that, look, again, these are not traditions that are meant to put people into camps. These are not traditions that are meant to, be a revolt against the bishops or a revolt against baby boomers or anything like that. This, this is beyond that. We don't need to get into that kind of fractional Catholicism. These are traditions that are beautiful, practical, efficacious, easy to follow, and that we should just bring back. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of a tradition, I know a tradition for the show is the Inquisition. It is. And hopefully it's a tradition that we don't have to follow this, uh, no, this episode. You know me. I'm a stickler for tradition. So we're going we're gonna to do some... We're gonna well, do now Inquisition. I have a lifeline with Father Justin here, so I might have to lean on my now, brother. Now, this is a dual Inquisition. Oh, fabulous. All right. So, aside from the traditions that we talked about briefly, what other tradition would you bring back? Well, uh, what, what would be one tradition I would bring back? Uh, I think um, I think the tradition of um, trying to make a confession before you receive communion as often as you can. Uh, um, the that some places don't like that to have like confession and mass happen at the same time. But I think that uh, the sort of the, the one, two punch of, of a confession and, and Holy communion together. Uh, right, so your soul is restored to its baptismal innocency every time you go to confession. And so your, your soul is never more ready to receive the grace of Holy communion than whenever, than whenever you just made a confession. And so uh, I like, that's a, that's a tradition that uh, if, uh, if, if, Space and time allowed, I think, would be a really, a really good one. I love receiving confession mm -hmm. during mass. You know. Oh yeah, and de devotional, the devotional sacrament of penance, in relationship to Saturday confessions. I love that, and I love communion on the tongue. Mm -hmm. And you know, so often I, I've heard people say, "Well, I, I would not receive Jesus on my hands because you know my hands are you know the deeds that I do and the sins that I." And I always respond, well, there's nothing more filthy than the human tongue in relationship to sinfulness, because the letter of St. James says very <laughs> clearly <laughs> that it is the sins of the tongue that defile the man. Yep. So, you know, the point is, tongue is yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, but, but the reaction, the, the response of being fed, like receiving, not taking, but receiving the posture of receiving and of a father feeding his young of feeding your child, you know, as an action of a priest, like in, in my heart, I want to feed my children. And when one receives that way, it's just so, it's just so beautiful. Not to, not to speak against what the norms of the church are today and the permissions of, again, it's uh, only meant to increase devotion. That's, that's all that it is, but it's a tradition that I, I uh, warmly appreciate for mm -hmm. sure. And yeah, then having cool. a communion rail with a patent and somebody is stable and kneeling and still, 
It just makes for an easier and target. And spatial, it makes it so much easier for distribution of Holy Communion That's as true. well. And That's safer true. that nobody's kind of taking the Blessed Sacrament yeah. and then an usher's chasing them down. But you down, know, if somebody does them. try to take it out of their mouth and you have the pat, you can hit them with that, it. That, yeah. <laughs> so Things are doing a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you hit them with it and then they're out and, you know, it's great. Welcome to Texas Catholicism yeah. right there. Texas right. justice. Texas yeah. justice. Right. Well, Father, this was awesome, man. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on here. My pleasure. And to all of our viewers, we thank you for joining us. Clearly, you know, give Father Justin some love online. And Father Justin, truly, it's it's been a, a blessing yeah. having you here. And continue to journey with us at catholictalkshow.com, at all of the social media sites. Continue to listen in and the audio services through Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and the like. And we look forward to your support and your continued contributions through the Patreon app at patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. God bless you. Mm.